To be young, gifted and black. Oh, what a lovely, precious dream. Track, take me back like a track. Back to the days of way back. Where we were up for sale or expected to fail as a young black male. Now it's enterprising, high socializing, trend setting the money, getting no Smith and Wesson. I can fill a dough like a baker man. I know they never thought I saw it in a paper plan. But we young, gifted, and black, Africa on the map. Not a dark brother considered the savior, man. It's a new year, freedom is here, my dear. Let me make it clear. I never been a breaker, but see me in the street looking sharper than a dagger. What? Yeah. Like the young Madiba with the swag of a soldier, mind of the owner. Track, take me back. Like eight track, back to the days of way back. Yeah. Back to the future, keep going like playback. Show them why we labeled young, gifted, and so black. Young, gifted, and black. We must begin to tell. Ani anna meida gza bitte desa. Tiba gza ani. Gabe bitte desa so esandi. There are two worlds. Natural and manufactured. Ancient and modern. Over the last 200 years, these worlds have collided and the last bastions of the old ways 
have all but vanished. The African Rift Valley has long been known as the birthplace of our species. Its densely populated Gamo Highlands in southwestern Ethiopia have remained the haven of agricultural diversity and organic farming since the birth of the agrarian age 10,000 years ago. Here, human civilization and the natural world it relies on are still interdependent and intimately linked. It is in this fragile harmony that the people of the Gamo might be holding the keys to our own survival. In our modern world, we've become gods controlling nature. And that's in large measure because in one century we went from two billion to six billion people. We've become this huge presence on the planet. And so all of a sudden, we do perceive ourselves as invincible. We can do anything. And that's where technology without limits has pushed us to this precipice of almost self-destruction because we have viewed nature as simply something to be used for humans for economic growth and power. As an ecologist, you hear all the time people talking about wild landscapes versus human landscapes. And one of the reasons that I just was so drawn to the Gamo is that the people living there have evolved along with that landscape for such a long time that it's, it's a landscape in which humans are part of nature. When I got to the, the Gamo, the biggest su surprise for me was how little this landscape has been touched by the past century. Um, we would interview farmers who were 100 years old and we'd say, well, it's the biggest change over your lifetime. And they'd kind of look at you funny and say, you know, change? What? Um, you know, it's, which in this century is just mind boggling. Yeah, I am Kapo Kansa here, standing in southern part of Gamo Islands. You know, everything in the world is not explored. You know, the spirituality, uh, people think that the earth is not speaking, the soil is not speaking, the sky is not speaking. But there is a kind of spirituality when the sky is roaring with thunderstorms and the rain is coming and the clouds are rising and there is an spirit in it. Fundamentally, uh, religious stories and cosmologies in particular have helped to really ground humans in this immense universe and give us this tremendous sensibility of the aliveness of the world around us in the animal world, in the plant world, starting of course with indigenous traditions who knew this in very fundamental ways. People believe that they are part of the nature and that they, they don't think that they are dominant and that they can exploit everything existing on the environment. They want to coexist with the mountain, with the rivers, with the road. When they make a prayer, they always give thanks for the creator. Then next to the creator, they say thanks to the mountain. And they offer gratitude to the road. They, uh, they walked up to their home. And the forest they crossed inside. So this is uh, to show that they are friends of the environment. In the Gamo, they have a system of laws called wogas that have been developed over thousands of years to ensure their survival. A local elder serves as the custodian and enforcer of each woga. There is a woga for how to bless a planting and how to give thanks when harvesting crops. There is a woga for where animals are allowed to graze. There's a woga for which trees are to be cut down. And wogas that govern relations between people like marriage or disputes. 
The custodians perform rituals to give thanks to the earth for the resources it provides. For the people of the Gamo, their delicate balance with nature is ensured through these laws and rituals. If any one aspect is neglected, then the entire system is at risk. Some pretty vocal evangelical Christian Protestant organizations have moved in and really created a lot of turmoil in this region. They started building churches right and left. Every community that has a Protestant church, sort of not in any sort of traditional style, just sort of slapped up there very hastily. They've basically been doing what Christian missionaries do best, which is handing out a lot of Bibles, handing out a lot of seeds and food, and it's working, and a lot of people are converting, especially young people. We Christians, we committed to obey what the Bible teaches to us. We see that people are uh, worshipping other things as a part of God. But this is, you know, ignorance. So we refuse that one when we understand the gospel. You know, in the past, uh, the church was not uh, so arrogant, but now the Protestant church, it wants to increase its members. When they preach, they make the traditional leaders to feel ashamed. Of. They say that you are, you know, demonic people. Because they are convinced that to follow tradition means something to, to go to the hill. You know, you have a car. Car is not God for you. you, are, you so trees and animals and whatever river, it's not God. We have to worship God. We have to use this for us, God created for us. Not only is that tacitly opposed to a lot of traditional beliefs about you know, how you should treat the landscape and how you should live your life. It's very vocally opposed to a lot of those things. So they sing these really beautiful songs as they're harvesting, as they're working, and a lot of these church groups are sort of forbidden to use those. They're building churches on sacred landscapes. I've seen it be really incredibly disruptive to not only people's spiritual lives, but, um, you know, relatedly to people's sort of working lives and community lives. The challenge, of course, is that uh, indigenous peoples um, have had this very unique worldview of the aliveness of the universe, and by and large, the monotheistic traditions, the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have suggested that God is above the world, a transcendent God, a creator God that orders and has a presence, but is lifted up out of the world. Now, removing God from nature, certainly many people would say has desacralized the world and therefore opened it up for consumption and for abuse and for exploitation. There's some definite truth to that. You know, we in our lives are all about maximization. The maximization of profit is, is seen as this huge good, whereas that's not really a the case there. No one's out to maximize. That's not really a concept. People are out to, to continue. <laughs> you know, to sustain. Uh, we can say it is just uh, two different worlds, and we are depending on uh, nature here, and uh, there people are depending on scientific funds. Through science, the industrial world has developed technologies to maximize agricultural output. These pesticides and fertilizers were first used in the Green Revolution of the 1950s and 60s. Supermarket, symbol of the high standard of living today. These products come from farms and ranches despite distance and season. They are the result of a miraculous agriculture. Tremendous advances on the farm and in the marketing system have created this miracle. The miracle whereby agriculture has advanced more in the space of a single lifetime than world agriculture had in more than 7,000 years. Today, agriculture is going far beyond nature to produce new miracles for an even better, more abundant life. 
I wasn't there for the uh, first Green Revolution, but uh, some of my colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation were. And the story they tell is that the world was really concerned that Asia was going to hit a population bubble and there was no foreseeable way to feed the population. And so there was really a concerted effort, sort of like a space program type, you know, grand challenge to develop ways to allow Asia to feed itself. And uh, those focused really on two principal crops, wheat and then on rice. These crops really took off and really solved for the time being that population problem. Fed a massive amount of people on a small amount of land. That was what it was all about, was maximizing yield. And it worked, they maximized the yield. But the problem is that, A, you have to have a very, very small genetic base in order to find that, that sweet spot, as it were. Um, and B, if conditions aren't perfect for it, then it doesn't do very well. If there's variable conditions, some years it can fail entirely. So it set up a system where if you had all the inputs and you could set it up exactly right, you would maximize your yields and you would do great. But if there was any other circumstances, then you were worse off than you started. Despite the detrimental effects of the first Green Revolution worldwide, and especially in India, international organizations and agricultural corporations are reusing these technologies and are preparing Africa for a new Green Revolution. Here in Africa, we've got a problem. There's not enough food available to the poor. People are losing their lives over that problem on a daily basis. We feel that you know, this is an overdue priority. Hunger in Africa cannot continue. In 2006, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation formed AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. AGRA's goal is to fight hunger by bringing green revolution technologies to small-scale farmers. But not all African farmers are welcoming these new saviors. Now, who are the proponents of the Green Revolution in Africa? Is it, does it have its origin in Africa? The concept in itself is foreign. It's not like supporting the farmers to develop their own and grow with their technology. It's bringing in, grafting the foreign technology, grafting the foreign idea on the farmers. If you look at this elder here, he has a lot of knowledge about herbs that are medicinal in this area. But he has no space to give that knowledge, to pass that knowledge to the younger generation. People here in Africa, they know the solutions to their most pressing problems, especially of hunger and famine. But rather than be given opportunities to harness their knowledge, what we are seeing is that quick fix solutions are being uh, formulated out there, like prescriptions in medicine, and they are brought and, to, and we are told, take this to deliver you. To get to the core of Agra, you need to unwrap several layers. You need to see who the players are who have come out as philanthropists coming to help, but whose ultimate goal, we are sure, is not philanthropic. We're aware that uh, there's skepticism over uh, whether Agra is simply trying to uh, pave the way for American businesses or businesses from other parts of the world. And I honestly don't know where that skepticism comes from. Because if people uh, would come out and see who we're working for, they would immediately realize that this is all about local. We work with local farmers, local technicians, local plant breeders. I don't agree that by involving a handful of farmers is actually a farmer-driven process. If anything, this is a uh, behind the scenes, corporate driven process. Agra is about profits. It's about making profits for those who are, pro who are producing the chemical fertilizers, the chemical sprays, and the improved seeds. If Agra started a project like that here in this village, we are going to see reduced income for the people because they are going through banks, assisting banks to offer loans to farmers. So you go get a loan from the bank, you go, you buy seeds, you buy fertilizer, and you buy chemical sprays. 
you go and plant. You have no control whatsoever about the climatic changes. So they, the, the, instead of rains, there is dry weather. The crops fail. So what happens? And you have a loan at the bank. So that means that you go dig deeper into your pocket. If you have a cow, you sell. If you have a goat, you sell so that you can furnish the loan in the bank. So rather than uh, improve the livelihoods of the people, it's going to make them more deeply in debt. I think the, the answer that we are often hearing right now to the challenge of food security in the future on a planet with soon 8, 9 billion people, to just invest in more herbicides, pesticides, hybrid seeds, uh, irrigation and fertilizers clearly does not hold the full answer. First of all, because we have learned that that kind of high input agriculture has a very high price on the very productive capital that a farmer has, land, water, the resources that are around him or her. In 2008, the United Nations Environment Program conducted a study comparing organic and conventional agriculture in Africa. What we found is that particularly in East Africa, there were actually significant increases in yield. In fact, 128% increase in yield. And that is certainly outperforming traditional agriculture and even outperforming some of the modern, let's say, industrial agriculture. According to the report, Organic agricultural systems are making a significant contribution to the reduction of food insecurity and poverty in areas of Africa. The study found that average crop yield increased by 79%. In many ways, this coming in of all this Green Revolution technology parallels the sort of coming of these evangelical Christian voices to, to the gamma in that taking the, the landscape that in which you live and making it something that's external to you. And they're saying, you know, this, this landscape is actually designed for, for productivity. And it's not a part of your belief system. It's not a part of your sort of cultural heritage. It's this piece of land which is designed to feed you, which is sort of how we view uh, our landscape in a lot of ways. If we view the world as a machine, we become a machine. The machine mentality that has simply said the universe, nature, are mechanistic processes. That's brought us only so far, and that's exactly the crossroads. One of the things that we see now in our current economic crisis is that was in large measure driven by an abstraction of economics apart from ecology, apart from nature itself. It became a global casino, a roulette, just a building on itself. On a planet where nature has evolved over millions of years, we need to learn more about the principles that nature has developed to cope with crisis. And a simple answer is resilience. Resilience you get through diversity. There's a massive trend away from diversity in commercial agriculture. I mean, of the five or six crops that feed most of this planet, we've gone from having thousands of varieties of those crops to maybe two or three that are really commercially produced. And those, those two or three varieties are designed to be incredibly productive, you know, to feed a lot of people, but it makes them very vulnerable to, to change, to make them vulnerable to pests, to disease, to outbreaks, because there's, there's very little genetic diversity among them. So if one thing gets knocked out, all the corn in you know, South America gets knocked out. The Gamo Highlands are um, considered a, a huge center of diversity for agricultural species. There's a lot of species which originated there or which have just been grown there for so long that they've diversified into hundreds of varieties there that don't exist anywhere else. So it's to places like the Gamo that people need to turn to sort of collect the genetic material for the crops that feed not just Africa, but all over the world. Clearly, the Gamo Highlands are an ecosystem that is vital to our survival, but its precious agricultural diversity is inextricably linked to its cultural diversity. In just 300 square kilometers, there are 54 different tribes, and every year they gather to celebrate and preserve their cultural heritage at the Thousand Stars Festival. A 
Some of them put pawn of an animal, some of them with the skin, and some put on uh, grass and leaves. And I think that all shows that the connection of each group to, to the environment, to the nature. And all of the group have their own uh, expression of connection to nature, although we can understand the language they are singing. It is not permitted uh, among gamos to take care of whatever he, he likes from the ground. There is a limit. There is a limit. You are taking uh, grasses which you need, you don't destroy others. You are taking trees for your consumption, not to destroy others. They want to uh, pass the resource for the next generation. Sustainable agriculture is holistic, and it, it addresses the needs, the spiritual, the cultural, the social needs of the person. So it's not like mining the land for today's or short-term benefits. We are looking into this uh, renewable use of the land. Agriculture, in a lot of ways, is the primary human signature on our world. That's how we relate to the earth more than any other way we do it. We shape it to help sustain us, and that's not something that's foreign, and that's, that has to be you know, this, this horribly disruptive, unnatural process. It can be a very natural process. It can be a really integral part of our lives. In 2008, three elders from the Gamo Highlands were invited to the United Nations to attend the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in New York City. People who are looking at the relationship between spirituality and ecology are realizing that biodiversity ecosystems are being destroyed because the Africans have severed their relationship between ecosystems and spirituality. It is very, very important for people to reintroduce that link, that relationship between themselves and the ecosystems. And then their spirituality becomes the key pillar in joining the two. Many indigenous peoples have had this, what we would call traditional environmental knowledge about hunting or farming or planting or practices of the seasons to bring in that universal power of the cosmos and bringing in that immediate power of nature itself. And part of what we have lost is we're trying to rely only on our own energy, but it's nature's energy that pours through us and which we need to draw on right now in our search for sustainable energies. It's spiritual as well as physical.